Good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar with Curvo on fueling higher contract yields. My name is Noor Sadik, and I'm the marketing manager here at Curvo. I want to thank you for joining us today and taking time uh, to be with us. I'm really excited for you uh, to hear uh, from Brad Nash. If you've never had a chance to hear him speak or interact with him, you are definitely in for a treat today. So as we are coming into uh, the webinar space here, we're just gonna wait a minute or two for everybody to be able to join us. So in the meantime, I'm gonna do a little bit of an exercise with you if you don't mind. So as you know, our, our concept today is unlocking your catalog's potential. So I'll leave that picture up for you and we'll talk about it a little bit further down the road. But I just wanna point out a feature here in Zoom and it's the chat button at the bottom, uh, probably of your toolbar in Zoom. So if you click that button there, and I do wanna test that and make sure it's working for you. Uh, if you click it and then switch the setting from panelists to everyone and the panelists, that way anytime throughout this webinar today that you would like to ask a question to Brad or our host, uh, Steve, you're able to plug it in there and share it with everybody to see because I'm sure other people have that thought as well. So let's just test and make sure that that button is working for you. So if you don't mind dropping a hi or tell us where you're joining us from or even what the weather is like for you. Uh, let's see, we've got somebody here in the chat. Hello, Michelle, how are you? From Kentucky, oh, snow, yes. I recently moved to the great state of California where uh, in the Bay Area, it's just cloudy today. Ooh, Illinois. Yes. San Diego. Is it warm there, Stephen? I'd be a little jealous of that. It's great to see some uh, familiar names. I think there's a joke in here. 80 and sunny in Indianapolis. Snow in Minnesota. I'd be interested in how many feet of snow. Well, welcome everybody from wherever you're joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time. And I will turn it over to Steve Sir Heinrich from Curvo Labs. Steve? Hi, everybody. Thanks, Noor. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We have got a really fun conversation with Brad Nash. And um, Brad is a friend of mine, and I'll get into that in just a second. I do see a lot of familiar people here uh, on here. We've got folks from um, University of California. We've got folks from UK. We've got uh, up in Oregon. Um, really, the whole country is kind of represented. And I know there's different roles and um, titles in that. And so we're excited to share with you. Um, let's go ahead and do the introductions. For those who don't meet, know me, I am Steve Sir Heinrich. I'm a co-founder at Curvo. I serve as our chief customer officer. So my focus is making sure that everyone um, gets their desired outcomes from using our software. And a lot of you on the call actually do have access to our orthopedics data and enrichment. And Brad, who I would like to introduce next, is really the um, main focus of this presentation. He's been using our data for 10 plus years um, so, Noor, if you go back to that slide with Brad there. There we go. Um, so, Brad and I actually met in around, we were talking about this yesterday to figure out when it was. We met 2014, I believe, and then got a chance to work more closely together while he was at Providence um, and using all of orthopedic data to do orthopedic projects there around um, cost savings and utilization and we got to know each other. He lives in San Diego. I live in San Diego. So we actually get to hang out. Um, haven't seen Brad personally, except on Zoom, since the pandemic started, but we're hoping soon to get together again. So we're going to have a lot of fun talking and um, handing it off to Brad to, to do this presentation. So just a little bit more on Brad, though. He does, you can read it here. He's worked at many large health systems. He's worked in consulting, and he now has his own um, company that he does consulting for. So he comes to us with uh, a lot of insight. And I know some of you on the phone know Brad too, and are um, who share in that kind of admiration for him. I, I affectionately kind of call him the surgeon whisperer, 
because he has got a way of talking and sharing data and telling stories so that not just surgeons, but other stakeholders as well can um, really understand. And he's so humble about the way he presents too that um, I think you'll learn a lot today. Welcome, Brad. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for taking this time. Uh, I suppose we'll jump into the presentation, uh, but before we do, I want to um, rec recognize all of the folks on the phone that are supporting our frontline workers during this period of upheaval. I know that the demands and supply chain are constant. You can have a perfect fill rate, but if you're out of AAA batteries, you're gonna hear it from every floor and every entity. I just wanna thank you tirelessly to reduce the likelihood of stockouts and um, improve service levels for the patients, gloves, batteries, respiratory supplies, all of those things right now, lab. Uh, you are the unsung heroes of the crisis right now and we appreciate you. Yeah, thanks, that's true. Thanks Brad for mentioning that. All right, before I hand it over to Brad, I wanna do, I wanna talk a little bit about the unlocking your catalogs potential. This is such a cool visual of this and we kind of picked, thought about which ones to pick and the idea of just really cracking the safe um, hit home. So Brad and I did a presentation in Pismo Beach last year for the California Arm. We got a lot of really good questions from the audience afterwards. And we're considering this sort of a part two. So if anybody was at that one, this is your part two from that presentation. Cause we got asked what's better constructs or or components. And, um, you know, Brad's gonna uncover that and talk about that today. So uh, before I hand it off to Brad, I'm gonna do a quick poll. And the polls are important. We always start these presentations because we wanna hear from you and we want the audience to see as well where everybody's coming from. And this will help guide us in the, uh, in where we're gonna take the conversation to. So there are four questions to this. We'll go pretty fast through them. Uh, but get ready to answer the poll. So the first one is when it comes to purchasing cardiac rhythm management devices like pacemakers, defibrillators, leads, that sort of thing, our primary purchasing methodology is, and you've got four choices, capitated, component, unsure, or other. So we'll wait about um, a few seconds here, 30 seconds or so. Love to get as much participation in this as possible. We have 33 people on the call today. And uh, I see 15 have answered. If you're only on your phone, you may not be able to answer, but um, we'd love to see us get some more. So I don't know if everybody can see the results coming in yet, but I'll, I'll give you some commentary on this. We've got 59% saying component pricing. We've got 26% saying capitated. And 16%, um, that's three unsure no others there oh, four unsure so 20 percent. so we've got 20 out of 34 Brad, uh, there we go so that was that thank you all for answering that one our next question is let's see is that one closed nor or do i yes. share the result okay mm -hmm. so we go to the next one all right um when it comes to purchasing spine hardware. Um, our primary methodology is mainly same answers, capitated, component, unsure, or other. All right. I see the answers coming in. We're at 10, 12, 13. All right. This is great. Thanks for participating, everybody. This is really helpful to see. Um, we've got 19, maybe a few more. All right. If you haven't answered this and you know feel free to jump in there. We've got 22 out of 34. We'll go with that right now. So we've got seven, say capitated, 12, say component, three, say unsure out of that. So it's 32%, 55%, and 14%. Any surprises on that, Brad? Uh, nope. Okay. Good. Great. Thank you, everybody, for answering that. we got two more quick ones. All right. The third one is when it comes to purchasing large joint replacements or upper extremity products, hip, knees, or shoulders, our primary methodology is mainly. Getting a lot of fast answers. I love seeing this. Okay, Capitated is leading the way right now, but Component is close behind. All right, 34, 20. Okay, good. Keep going, everybody. We're getting close. Um, thank you for answering so quickly. We got 23 out of 34. That's been 
about where we were before. So from this, I'll read off, we've got 52% 12 say capitated, eight, or eight, so 35% say component, and a few of you are unsure, and that's okay. Great. All right. So we'll that's, cap it, Brad. that's thirty-five. Um, what was the what was the capitated number? Fifty-five percent. Fifty-two percent capitated. Thirty-five okay. percent component. Okay. okay great. All right. Last question. Thank you all for answering these. When you if you answered capitated, so the twelve of you who answered that, this is for you. To what extent are you confident that you're getting what you pay for? according to the contracts that you put in place. All right, so first one's a little bit confident, mostly confident, very confident, or not confident. And finally, this is a trick question and I'm not going to answer it. So be honest, everybody. Okay, good, great. Excellent. Um, we've got 10, 11, all right, that's great. So 12, excellent. Thank you all for answering. Um, so we have leading the pack here is mostly confident. That's wonderful. 43% mostly confident. Um, then a little bit confident is 14%. Very confident is 14%. Not confident is 29% actually. Mm. So, so I'm glad you answered that way. And I saw that um, I think Stephen... You, you posted a chat. We actually have a component model with capitated pricing by product category, except for ortho that is construct. Okay, that's interesting. That's good to know. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Brad, what do you think okay. about these poll results? Well, this is the interactive stage of the presentation first. Thank you for responding. Uh, I wanted to get a feel for who was in the crowd and what their confidence levels were. This is a multidisciplinary group, which is one of the reasons we didn't put together a formal agenda. It is a sort of a nonlinear exploration of the debate, the age old debate of what's better construct or component. And <clears throat> we didn't answer this question up in Pismo, <clears throat> mainly because the shot clock ran out on us. But there's always going to be the debate in supply chain. There's the groupers and then there's the splitters. And uh, I've had this debate over and over myself, but what you're proving here is that each environment is different. Even if it's a small sample size of polls, it still indicates to me that there are some practices in place that might have preceded you or uh, change hasn't occurred for you. And, and I think in the last seven years of my work, I've been working with hospitals that were construct in the orthopedics or musculoskeletal categories. And we, we changed them usually in one contract cycle from a construct to a component. I'll get into reasons why, but I hope that you all get something out of this and know we are not persecuting the construct or the grouper cohort, and we're not lauding the component or splitter group. We believe that all of these groups are important and can learn something today, okay? Absolutely. Thanks for clarifying that, Brad. Sure. Uh, and maybe if, if you're turning it over now, I, I'd like to just lay out some ground rules, if you don't mind. If you notice, I moved this webinar into my personal study. You can see it behind me. Uh, just a few rules for the study. One, there's no smoking in the library. Please don't smoke. Also, if you take a book, please don't dog ear the pages so that somebody else can use them too and respect the, the, the body of work. Uh, if you're chewing gum, that's okay. Please don't chew loud and don't put your gum under the chair. And then finally, we're going to break one of the main rules of libraries, which is you don't have to worry about whispering because we actually want to hear from you. I am trying to be funny here. My wife is a librarian. This is her background, but this is an opportunity for all of us to build on our knowledge together and share, not just for me to, to tell you what I think, but to hear what you think as well. Okay. Let's go ahead and go to the next page and get this going. By the way, we'll be talking, if you'll go back one more time, we will be talking about number three, which will be large joint replacements and upper extremity products. And I'm sorry if you came here and you wanted to talk about spine or cardiac rhythm, uh, but a lot of the disciplines you'll build on in number three are transferable to numbers two and one and just about any other uh, clinical category. 
All right, let's Absolutely. go ahead and move over. Yeah. And, and Brad, thanks for mentioning that about um, speaking up. Uh, I think everybody's on mute. So speak up through your chat. Um, I will be watching the chat and we can interject with those questions as they come or hold them to the end. But we will save time for questions at the end for sure. And we would love to, to engage and talk. And we'll stay as long as necessary for that too. All right, Brad, thanks. Okay. Well, here we are. Uh, we're in this new era of data visualization, and I'm sure many of you are in different degrees of evolution towards embracing and using visuals. One of the reasons I'm showing you a visual now is because we know from experience, I learned from experience, that people will retain information when they see it in a visual form versus in a, uh, a linear expression or, or a verbal one or a bullet point. I think I read recently a study that said folks will remember 50 to 70% of the content that they see if it's in a visual form versus only 10 to 20% if it's written. That's really, really important. So what, what I'm gonna do here is show you just a sample visual in the work that I've been able to do with really talented folks, just like you. I saw we had a lot of decision support people, analysts on this call, contract managers, supply chain directors. We had a, a, a wide selection of professionals on the phone, all of whom are gonna be interested in this kind of thing. I, I want you to know we have built together over a hundred different visuals. I'm showing one to you now just to get us started. And we'll be talking about primary hips, elective hips in this visual. And I know most of you already know what you're looking at. If so, great. For those of you who don't, I'm gonna walk you through it a little bit and uh, tell you why it's in here. One, it'll keep your attention more if you have something to look at. Two, you can get ahead of the speaker, which is usually good for everybody. If you've had to hear from me before, you're rolling your eyes now. And I apologize for those of you who haven't met me before. Please try to be limber and just buckle your seatbelt. Uh, what you're looking at here is a survey, a survey of approximately 2,000 hips of every variety that you're all purchasing. Some of you might only do 100 hips a year. Some of you might do 1,000. It's all relevant to the discussion about variation, price performance, perhaps value analysis. All of you can take something away from this. I'm going to give you a perspective about this one. This sample that you see here is a survey based on PO spend. This is just raw PO spend. That means it hasn't been enriched. There are not component part numbers in here. It's an aggregation of one year of utilization from a pre-pandemic period. And that's important to state because there's been a lot of disruption in 2020 due to the pandemic. So here is a complete sampling of 2000 hips. The larger the bubble, the larger the throughput with that particular vendor. And in large joints, I think most of you would, would probably say at three or four vendors have probably 90% of your book of business. If that's true, then you can focus your gaze on the vendors to the left, that's silo vendor one, two, three, four, five. What this does is this tells me as a supply chain worker, what's the scatter like? What's the price at the pump for each vendor? And you can see we have some variation. And if you have extended your contracts multiple times, uh, settling for cost avoidance or three to 5% uh, savings, it, it's really important to conduct these surveys so that you see where the leaks are. Sometimes you'll have a leak, sometimes there'll be creep, but sometimes you have tectonic shift. And in this particular case, we have some tectonic shift. Uh, if you look at the dollar sign on the bottom, that would be the price floor, and that's the metal on poly hip. And if you go to the very top with the $4 signs, that's actually 50% higher. The cost per the direct cost for the implants, we're looking at just implants, it's 50% higher. And you'll notice we're becoming top heavy as a program here. The utilization has shifted. This was a three year contract. Some of you are renewing every two and you're doing it regularly, even if it means cost avoidance or just kicking the can down the road a little longer because you're going through a pandemic and you're running out of capacity to serve. This is important for me to see as a an orthopedic battle wagon because I can tell what the surgeons are doing. And if you look up at the top, you can see the standard of care there is in the middle. That's your ceramic on poly hip. And then those bubbles on top of that are uh, derivatives there. Uh, 
they could be dual mobility hips. They could be ceramic on ceramic hips. They could be hip resurfacing products, or they could be hips that are using revision components. And that's why you see there's a drift higher. That is not an accident. Some of that is clinical evidence is changing, but some of it is creative sales and marketing. What I assume when I look at these bubbles is that the surgeons are mostly in the dark about what their, their imp, the implants cost. How do I know? Because I've met 300 surgeons in the last six years, all of whom are doing hips, knees, or shoulders, or spine products. I ask them up front, how many of you know how much your implants cost? And I usually get about 10% or 20. That's where the power of the data enrichment helps us when we manage the bottom line is when we can serve by giving information to the physicians who are the ones that will help us move price together. Uh, in, in this case, this lays out the work that this health system wants to do. If you're in the 50th percentile, your goal might be to get to the 40th. If you're in the 40th, your goal might be to get to the 30th and to the 25th and to the 10th percentiles. Six, six years ago, I started with a large program. They were in about the 50th percentile. They're now in the 10th percentile. Some of you may think you can't get there because you're a small entity. It's not true. There is no relationship between price or price performance and program volume. It has everything to do with your data and your resolve and your interdependent commitment to lowering costs and reducing variation. I've seen it time and time again. Standalone hospitals can move price sometimes faster than a large behemoth organization with more assets to, to move price. Uh, do, does everybody understand this slide before I get on to some of the more esoteric aspects of it? Okay, Steve, interrupt me if you have somebody hung up. Just incidentally, when you look at this, this would be a dynamic slide. This wouldn't be a PowerPoint. You can see I've selected the construct types. And uh, one of the things I can do is I can localize a trend by, by filtering on a facility. You can see up there on the right. So I could see, you know, who's driving the red bubbles higher? Okay, this hospital, great. We'll custom tailor a presentation around this hospital and this vendor. Who's driving purple? Oh, that's a dual mobility hip? I heard that that's only supposed to be 8% of the patients. Why is it 35% of these vendor transactions? What's behind that? We can find out down to the surgeon uh, and we can tailor a presentation to that particular entity or that particular surgeon and then show them uh, the degree to which their costs are higher, whether they derive a benefit from that, that's another matter, but we can at least show the, the cost delta there. And you can see all your vendors on the bottom. Uh, I'll go to the next slide if everybody's hey, ready. Yes. Brad, question for you here. So you're looking at, at the construct right here um, and you are typically using orthopedic network news classification to get the components, which then tells you, can you explain a little bit how you get to the construct? You bet, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, to restate this, this is an aggregation of PO spend only. This is about as vanilla as it gets. This gives a supply chain professional just a snapshot of what a year looked like and to also gauge the drift from what the goals were two years ago when they implemented this versus where they want to go as an organization. The parts that Steve's referring to is what's missing here. We do not have part detail in this particular visual. That doesn't mean it's not powerful or effective, especially when you unmask the dollar signs. Uh, maybe your floor is $5,000 and you don't know it, but this top floor is 8,000. That would eat up 50% of your Medicare payment. Uh, that's a, not, it's not a crisis, but it's a problem you can solve. Uh, the reason that I advocate for uh, using your components is because they tell a more powerful story than this. Uh, a, a simple takeaway from here would be costs are not my problem, they're your problem, I'm busy. But when you tell the component story, now you've got surgeons and clinicians that are interested in seeing what's the driver. Okay, I can live without that, or I can live without that 90% of the time I'll make changes. That's sort of, that gives you a sneak preview of what's to come a little bit later. Does that answer your question, Steve? Yes, yeah, thanks, Fred. Okay, let's go to the next slide please. Some of you were thinking, 
Well, we've done constructs for years. It's easy. It doesn't take up a lot of data space. We only have a thousand rows of transactions in each year because of it. Uh, what if what if we don't have what it takes to split these out? Well, I'm going to show you that it might not be as hard as you think. And some of you have already done this. And again, if you have already split to components or you're never going to shift away from constructs, I'm going to give you something in both environments. But this is an example of what you might look like today if you're construct. I think it's very common in joints for, for it to be construct. And one of the reasons I chose this today is uh, one, your large joint replacement program will probably be your largest spend driver in all of your categories. Uh, it's here to stay, it's not going away. Uh, two, it tends to have a, a higher degree of difficulty. And that has everything to do with uh, knowledge of the material, which you don't necessarily have to have to be successful, but also the surgeons that are doing joints are very busy. There is a shortage of surgeons doing these cases. And uh, also year after year, I read job satisfaction surveys within the clinical areas. Year after year after year, I think 10 years running, the, the orthopedic surgeons had the lowest job satisfaction of any category. Now that doesn't mean that that's true for every surgeon or that you'll have a higher degree of difficulty with your engagement. It just indicates that you wanna have empathy and humility when you're sharing cost data with orthopedic surgeons as with any surgeons that they do have higher mandates and the parts and pieces world really will come down to timing and courtesy and empathy. So I, I know I went off the rail there a little bit but I'm gonna show you what a, a ceramic on poly hip looks like nor you can switch forward. So today you might be construct and tomorrow this is what you would do. You'd be going from one row to four and you can advance one more time if you'd like. And we've got pictures here. This is where the data enrichment is so important. As I said, the, the, it's so important to have a visual. And that's why we took the time to show you what a femoral stem might look like. Uh, you see a coated femoral stem there. That's about 97% of the hips, maybe 95. I'd have to look at orthopedic network news to be sure. But that really is a standard of care. So one of the things you can do with your suppliers and your surgeons is show them the variation by stem. It would surprise you. Uh, that physicians care what the cost of their stem is uh, that they're using. And we've got an illustration here to show you. There's the part numbers. One of the things we do when we break off from a construct to a component is we set firm ceilings on the commodities. I call them commodities because a lot of vendors have these. And none of these physicians is working on a sapien that doesn't resemble another sapien that another surgeon's working on. They all go into homo sapiens. And if you look at the acetabular liners, every vendor, every patient will have an acetabular liner, whether it's polyethylene, cross-linked polyethylene, highly cross-linked polyethylene, vitamin E, mobile or not mobile, it's a liner. And one of the things I've seen health systems time and time again is hard line. This is what we're paying for these liners, whether they're vitamin E, XLPE or PE, uh, there hasn't been a game changer in the liner, in the plastics in, in 15 years, probably since the, the cross-linking. So they're all really good. And by the way, on knees, 70% uh, of knee tibial inserts are not vitamin E. So if you're paying more for vitamin E, uh, there's a little bit of a juxtaposition of reality versus hype. And I'll get to knees later, but this is how you can break the, the cycle of uh, complacency or a plateau in your price performance by splitting from a construct to a component and hardwiring it lower. You can see how we've gone down 15%. Maybe your goal is to save 10 ultimately, and you know how hard it is to take 10% out. It's hard, especially with the orthopedic vendors. They know what they're doing. They are better than us. They outflank us. They have the um, advantage on the ground and you, we all have different priorities. So in this particular instance, I'm showing you a 15% hypothetical lower than, you may end up settling for 11 when it's all over, but you'll learn a lot and you'll be planning green sh shoots for the future. Let's go to the next slide and I'll step on the gas here, Steve, unless you tell me otherwise. Let's go to the um, next one. I'm gonna pause yep. for a second because we're getting an interesting question from Joe. 
and I wanted you to kind of um, have sure. a chance to look at this. So he's asking specifically around the categorization. Do you categorize each component to roll it up into ceramic on poly construct costs? And then I, I so yes, we do categorize every component and there's several parts of enrichment, including material, um, different levels of classification with each one. And then the, the follow-up question from Joe was, so the category is the same across all suppliers by catalog number. So if I'm understanding that question correctly, you would be, we are enriching based off this specific part. And so you could then look across vendors and say, these are all um, ceramic heads, or these are all acetabular liners, and they all match the same enrichment levels. Um, and then you could look and see that price comparison. You could see the utilization comparison across vendors that way. And so it is much easier. And Brad, you've worked with this kind of data at the component level. Anything you'd want to add to that question yeah. and answer? I, yeah, I like the question. We're going to go there too. Uh, grouping these products or homogenizing them is really important because as I stated, they are commodities. If you're working with a company like Curvo or you're working with your, your GPO, uh, they will likely have tools that will help you uh, launder your parts and group them. And you'll know what to do once you have them grouped. Uh, you may even identify that for the revision cases, even though it is a liner, it may cost more. And you, what you'll do is you'll parse those. You'll have the revision survey in one area, and then you'll have your primaries in another. But grouping, this is where you, you split and group. You split the products out, and then you group them together together. Through doing so, you can compare your vendors and your current state. Great. Let's Thanks, go over. Brad. Let's go over to knee, and I'll step on the gas, knowing we're uh, halfway through here. here. Here's how your knee looks. I won't spend as much gas on this, but I've put sample pricing in here. Each of you is paying a different price, and you can see a picture of what a knee looks like right there. Uh, I like that because it relates the products to one another, and uh, you know, one of the things I'll say is this. Um, this category is likely to be 80% or more of your knees for at least the next three or four years or until cementless knees prove to be worth the, um, the consideration. Historically, cementless knees have not performed as well or reliably as cemented knees. So don't get married to the label cemented knee or cementless. Don't assume that it's a cementless knee. It doesn't have cement because we learned from orthopedic news recently that 25% of cementless knees had cement. So what I'm seeing in vendor catalogs is non-porous or non-beaded. You can call it whatever you want, but Curvo will have a way to uh, attribute those products for you so that it reduces the degree of difficulty when you're parsing. You can see the exercises the same for knees. You're gonna go from one row to four. And in some cases, you're going to have five because you have a vendor that's putting in an extension stem. I'm not addressing that now because it's, it is more esoteric, but we're seeing more of that. And just know here's a reset of 10% lower in the knee category. By the way, if you did read the newsletter, you would know most programs are going to do eight hip or eight knees for every five hips. Some of it might be nine to five, seven to five, but I, I tend to go by the two to one. You, you're likely to be doing two knees for every one hip. So when you target your goals for your next cycle, think about your knee and weight your target prices around your final objective in, in, in whatever it is. But just know this, you're likely to be doing more knees than hips. Does this all make sense to everybody when you see these images? Okay. Steve, unless, unless you want to entertain a question, let's go to the next slide and give them something else to okay. think about. Go ahead. All right. Some of you are thinking, okay, so we break up our constructs and we go to components. How do we know what we're looking at? How do we know if our program is normal or deviant? To, to what degree is that even important if a surgeon says, get out of my way, I'm going to put in the implants that I want to put in no matter what? And by the way, you, you will get some of that, uh, but one of the ways to break through the apathy about cost is to enrich the information and present it in a respectable way and make choices easy on the physicians. Try to give them a way out or flexibility. Everybody likes options. Even if you're an apex orthopedic surgeon, 
They want to know what their options are. But this is how I learned to do more with my catalog. And I've worked with a lot of places is I would read Orthopedic Network News. Uh, at least 10 years, I've been reading it to make sense of the parts. And if you haven't seen this yet, it really is the Rosetta Stone for your analytical surveys. You can see there on the right, we call this a, we call this a decoder. This will tell you everything from the percentage of vitamin E inserts in a knee in the national market compared to your market. So if you see 80% of your knees are Zimmer and they're all vitamin E, you're likely to be paying a higher premium for that unless you've already climbed that mountain and, and, and summited it and lived to tell about it. Some of you are hung up on vitamin E. Some of you might be hung up on um, nickel free. Uh, some of you might be hung up on mobile be bearing hips and you wanna get that taken care of. The newsletter can help you understand those better. And you can see a chart here. I, I wanna lend to you that this is one of my secrets to success is if you have a health system and you do 800 hips a year, you may not think that that sample size is going to speak very loudly to a physician, especially a, an aloof physician. And so what I would tell you to do is suggest you do, take your, your survey and use some of the slides from Orthopedic Network News, which is one of Curvo's tools, to give a deeper survey size. And if you take a look at the bottom here to the left, this is roughly 8% of the US procedures. This is so powerful, uh, not just because of how many cases it represents, but the accuracy. The, the accuracy is so powerful. And many of you have learned, you can't do a presentation if the story is not reliable. It's the political currency upon which all of our jobs depend. And one of the things I get to do is if I see a hospital that is 90% cementless or beaded or porous, that's a powerful story when I can show that physician group that they're far outside of the parameters of what a normal program looks like. And you're seeing 87,000 knees in this 2019 period. Uh, 2020 is likely to be 30 to 40% lower due to the pandemic, but this is still relevant because it shows a continuum. The cemented knee is likely to be here to stay. Any questions or comments about this? Have, I'll um, ask, have any of you read this? So I think they're all on mute, Brad, so you're probably okay. not gonna hear back. But um, Stephen did have a question and, and I would like to ask, I'll ask that, but then I've got a follow up to this one here for you too. So Stephen said, how do you handle special material or coding claims for additional longevity or metal allergy benefits such as auxinium? How do, how do you, any suggestions for that? Absolutely. Uh, I have a number of suggestions and I'll, and I'll minimize the amount of time it takes. If uh, everybody will have an opinion relative to nickel free, and if you're talking about auxinium, uh, it hasn't proven to be a game changer for elective knees time after time, year after year. Uh, I attend at the Acad American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons every year. Every other year, there will be a, a research on whether or not nickel free is proven to be longer lasting. And time and time again, it has proven not to be a more uh, a superior choice to your cobalt chrome. Now, if your physicians are testing for allergies, uh, sensitivities, it's definitely it's uh, prudent and sociomedically ethical to use that product. But more importantly, if you're paying three or 4% more for it, it may not be relevant to a discussion with a surgeon, but if it's 15% or more, they may not be aware of that. In which case I wouldn't lead in with the research. The goal isn't to tit for tat to the surgeons. The goal is to unlock and democratize the information they'll see that the nickel free premium may be above their personal pain threshold. And I'll, and I'll quote, I think I read this in orthopedics this week, for surgeons that have their own ASCs or an affiliation with an ASC, they responded to a poll question which said, what percentage decrease of implant costs would prompt you to change implants? And the number was 15%. So what, what I've sort of done is, thought about that as well, if it's if the hospital's paying for it, it's probably gonna have to be 20% because it's somebody else's money. 
So to answer your question, Steve, if you're paying 20% more for oxinium, keep bringing that information to the table when you talk to your surgeons and show them the opportunity cost for using the standard of care. If the opportunity cost is seven, $800 a case, keep at it. You can win that, okay? Uh, again, cementless knees, don't mistake cementless knees as not having cement because we're seeing it. And it is, it's a concern because surgeons who use cementless knees and put cement in them are making it harder to take those knees out later. Uh, this is the secret that, for me that that's sort of been missing from supply chains that are very, very siloed in their own um, um, priorities. And there's a lot of them. Uh, if you want to be more credible with your analysis, take your utilization and compare it to a larger survey and show those slides next to each other in your own way. You saw a visual earlier. That's one way to do it. Just kind of burp it all up. But some of you are going to have much more um, evolution behind your visuals, and you're going to know how your constituents consume information to the greatest effect. We'll go to the next slide. And we're almost done, folks. For those of you that have a short attention span like I do, here's where we get off visuals and we get to final takeaways to make your time worthwhile. And I hope you're getting to enjoy your lunch if you're eating it now. Uh, here are some of the summaries. Uh, Steve asked me not to forget this. In the last six years, uh, I've seen roughly $50 million come out of just large joint replacement products, just large joints by going to components and using this kind of a playbook. And it takes persistence. The hospitals do have to renew these contracts. You do have to get to know your orthopedic vendors better. But the goal of this is get this information to your surgeons, to your value analysis committees. Where you're strong, go there. And uh, if you can localize a pattern that you wanna correct, then spend more time there killing them with kindness and empathy and humility, and, but get your story right. Here we go. These are the final takeaways. There's only seven of them, which means we're almost at the end. One, part numbers don't lie. This is really important because your data, when you look at your constructs, there may be deceptions in your constructs. I know this happens routinely and it can cost you thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars if your constructs aren't being billed correctly. And I think some of you uh, humbly responded that you weren't very confident that your vendors were billing right. And by the way, your vendors aren't all set against you. Some of them mistake your costs for another hospital. They're switching surgeons and they make mistakes. So please don't jump to the conclusion that they're all nefarious cartels that are trying to rob the bank, okay? Give them a, give them a chance uh, to reconcile any of the the errors that occur. Parts don't lie. It's the most reliable thing in your catalog is the part number. The descriptions aren't reliable. The conversion factors might not be reliable. The entities could be wrong, but the part numbers, if you get them in there right, they're going to tell you everything and your surgeons want to know these stories. Homogenize the components. It's going to be pretty easy. Many of you are very savvy on this phone about grouping your products and looking at deltas. That's fairly easy to do. And that's coming from me. I'm a 50 year old. I'm not real good at pivot tables, but you will know what to do once you have these things homogenized. I hope you, want, you know what I mean by homogenizing like components. And Steve, that does mean if you have a nickel free product and it's a femur, it goes in with all the other femurs. And if that's the single component that you're seeing a 12 or 13% increase premium, that's an opportunity for you and your organization. Let's go to number three, please. This is where it helps you with your yield. Some of you have already done everything that I've talked about and you wanna know how do I wield more power with my negotiations? This is a chance for you to prescribe to your suppliers what it will take to qualify for another contract that may go two or three years and it's by setting strict ceilings on these components. And when they come back with marketing, you just rebuff it. That's, that's not where this organization is going. And eventually your vendors will acquiesce to this if they know that there's conviction behind it, especially in your entities. So you're changing from, hey, let's make a deal to no, this is the new deal. Thank you for your cooperation. Uh, I know it sounds a little bit um, gruff, 
but it really is, it can be an eat what you kill business. And so hopefully this helps you with that. Let's go to number four. You wanna control this catalog. I think 90% of your products are already in as components. And uh, I, I'll say one more thing. Whenever I work on a project and we do something like this, we put out a consolidated price file to all of our constituents, especially the super users, the folks that are verifying price in the trenches. They're not used to having reliable information that they can click in 30 seconds and override an overpayment right there on site. That's the power of the part number and the reliability of the price. So control the catalog, you control the cost. You won't have that tectonic creep that you saw in that previous visual where I showed you 50% uh, surge in cost that's run amok. Let's go to number five, please. By the way, I didn't see anybody from CDM in the, in the registry today, but your charge description master, these folks are often at the end of the purchase activity record, but they are so important. They love clarity. Part numbers give them clarity. They can now link a price to a part number. And then if there's ever an audit, they don't lose sleep over it. Uh, and I had a call with Renown, uh, some folks from Renown Health about three months ago about this. I love getting questions about the CDM because it's an area that I'd like to build more muscle around and understand and have more empathy. Let's go to number six. We're almost done, folks. Thanks for hanging in there. Future Bloom. This, this is, I, I wanted to put this in here because many of you are measured. Your, your jobs are, are measured on your quantitative uh, improvements lower cost, um, higher quality, all of those things. I'll tell you when, you, when you do move to the components, especially in large joints, you now are planting green shoots for future qualitative and quantitative performance improvement. What do I mean by that? If I speak to surgeons today and they're, I'll just use vitamin E as an example, they're 90% vitamin E. Now they may, they may adjust their age criteria for that they may change to 20% without telling me that they did it. Just by responding to the value of the conversation, you don't know what you're going to harvest in your next contract. Your goals may be modest this time, it's 8%, but maybe you wanna get 5% utilization in the next contract because you will have hit your 25th percentile goal and now you're just squeezing the sponge out for more. This enables you to squeeze the sponge out for more because you've built more political credibility and currency with your end users, not just your surgeons either, your perioperative directors too. When you call them in three years to do this again, they're gonna know it's worth their time. That's where I put quantitative and qualitative. You can probe influence utilization autonomously this way. Very easy, you run these reports monthly, whether you run it through a curvo to launder it for you or with you, or your GPO or yourselves. You can create your own taxonomy for these products uh, with, with little input from outsiders. And then the lastly, here's number seven and then we're done. Uh, the more you know, the less you pay. That's not my quote. That comes from Stan Mendenhall and it's proven to be true time and time again. Every time I learn something new and I test it with an engagement, the health system ends up paying less. Last screen. Hey, Brad. Yeah. Um, before you go on, that was great. I've got a few questions that popped up and um, Leslie, I hope you're still on. If she may have jumped off, but I wanted to address her question here before you go to the next slide. Um, do you recommend caps to constructs in the component method to prevent add-ons? Yeah, add-ons are germane to our environment. If these companies are putting out two or three new product introductions a year. Luckily, it's not more often than that. But if you have a supplier that hasn't really harmonized with your goal as an organization, you're gonna likely have add-ons. I'll simply say this, whether it's an add-on construct or an add-on uh, component, not every add-on turns into a disaster. Sometimes they're truly used 2% of the time. Usually when you have good alignment with your physicians. So if I sound like I'm filibustering or tap dancing here, what I'm simply saying is the better you get at this, the less you'll have to worry about the add-ons because you will have capped. 
those products. Any future t acetabular liner that comes into my hospital is $800. Our surgeons have bought into this. They care about affordability. They care about reduction of vari variability across vendors. And we thank you for this. Uh, so add-ons occur in both environments, construct and components. I can't tell you that they're gonna go away, but if you have quarterly meetings with your vendors, you can cure the add-on disease by interdependent exercises with your vendors. Uh, that's, that's the only way I know how to fix the add-on concerns. I hope that answered your question. Is there another one? Yes, yeah, it looks like Leslie was on and she says thanks, so that's great. Um, Good. So we are gonna, we've got a few more questions that have popped up. I saw yours, Stephen, um, but Brad, you could wrap up your part if you're ready, if you wanna do that, and then we could go all into questions. Yeah, I, I, I'm really done here. What, what you're getting today is just new ideas. Uh, there is nobody that has all the answers in this industry, in this field. It is too complex. Health systems have different risk tolerance and appetite for risk. But I know this, this value story has an audience with an appetite for it. Don't underestimate that your audience wants to see this story. The opportunity costs have never been more important. And in the example I showed you before, uh, when you, you know, it, can you go back to the visual one more time, Noor? I think it's slide three or four. I'm just gonna tell you how it ended uh, with eight minutes left. I'm just gonna show you the visual, how it would look at the end. No, I didn't uh, create it to show you, but I'm just gonna show you how this story ended. This was the beginning. All of those bubbles at the top are now halfway below, halfway between the one and the $2 sign, every one of them. And there will not be add-ons, not because it's a punitive uh, part of the work, but because it is a part of the interdependent aspirational goal of the project to curb the leaks and the shifts. That's where they are now. And they're in the lower quartile. If you're using Visient or ECRI, that's the upper quartile. That just means performing better than 75% of like-minded organizations. That's where that is. And it is easier to enforce when the next products come out because you just line them up with the predicate product price as long as you got what you wanted. And if you don't get it in the next cycle, that's okay. You will have built more muscle and abilities and then you'll get it in the following cycle. That's all, Steve. Group, thank you. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Brad. And we can go to questions. I've um, Anybody who has one, just post them in the chat. I'm going to, I know, Stephen, I saw you had one up above. I'm going to go ahead and get that one. And then feel free to jump in there and ask questions. We will stick around as long as anybody wants to. Um, so Stephen said, when you break down constructs, do you expect to flatline all pricing and paying the same amount for the construct components versus revision items? I'll ask you to read that one more time, and maybe I'll okay. take a bite of the Snickers so I, uh, I pump myself up. See the question one more time. When you break down constructs, do you uh -huh. expect to flatline all pricing and pay the same amount for the construct components versus revision items? Oh, okay, good. You're you're asking about differentiation. Uh, what I what I recommend is you walk before you run. So look at the greatest concentration of products, which will be your elective procedures. Remember, your revision procedures are only probably gonna to amount to about five or 6% of your total procedures. And you'll have a different strategy for revisions. Uh, <clears throat> there are no two revisions that are the same unless it's a poly swap or a, a, an insert change out. So <clears throat> what I recommend this is, say you're paying 5,600 for a knee and your company wants to take 10% out, then you reset that construct to a component schedule that is about 13 or 14% lower than you wanna go so that you can risk adjust for your negotiations. Set the components at least two or 3% lower than where you wanna end up. And you can look at your revision components separately. You may see some patterns. You can group those revision products. You can look at what is a revision uh, tibia cost with Stryker compared to Smith and Nephew. And you may have a different creative solution for those. I hope that answers your question. If not, please email after. Any other questions, Steve? 
Yep, there are. And I just want to let everybody know before everyone drops off that we will be sharing that 2020 hip and knee edition from Orthopedic Network News in the follow-up email Nor will send. Um, so you can have access to that. And um, there's a lot of good content and, you know, feel free to reach out to Brad if you have any questions about what parts to use in your presentations. I know he'd be happy to, to help. But now back to the question. How do you manage negotiating new technology costs versus your current formulary pricing? Yeah, I, I love it. it. It shows that all of you are thinking ahead. We've lowered our costs on our components. We are now running our data monthly for future harvest. And how do you manage the new product entries? It's fairly easy. Once you set a price for a commodity, and they come out with that next time. I know Medaca just came out with a vitamin E uh, polyline. Guess what? Medaca, thanks. Because you've qualified for an award under our current contract, we won't be paying a premium during this contract cycle, perhaps in the future cycle. Your physicians by now, they have heard the story about the implants. They are now interested in what their vendors bringing to the table. Most of the time, this kind of thing doesn't end up in arbitration somewhere like value analysis because you've already set a prescribed price for your commodities. I know that sounds like it's not true. Believe it. Uh, if you're giving this information to your clinicians, your end users, your perioperative directors, and your value analysis committee is savvy to what the price schedule is, then it takes some of the emotion out of a new product that's promising but not proven. I've seen it time and time again. And by the way, that vendor is more anxious to get that product in than they are to get another $150 for it. Uh, ultimately, they'll usually acquiesce and say, just load our 40 items, we'll meet your pricing. You have to wear them out a little bit. I'm sorry, but you do. You still have to wear these folks out. Any other That's questions good. with three minutes left? Um, yeah, I had it. Well, let's see, anybody else? Drop them in. We're getting some thank yous from folks. I, I think people really appreciate your um, insights here, Brad. And you've been actually requested to come back for another session sometime. Oh, no. Part three. Oh, I'm sorry for the people. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, put, put me out of work. These tools can really do it yourself. These are do it yourself tools tools. I've done it with Curvo for the last seven years. I, I, it's probably going to be hard for me to change to somebody else uh, simply because I, I found it to be politically dependable. And that's important for you all because you want to grow in your professions. Any other questions? Yeah. You know, I don't see any more coming from the audience. We've got a couple more minutes. Please drop them in if you do. I, I was thinking about a part three, Brad. I think it would be really interesting someday to talk through what visual visuals you use to um, to share with the surgeons from Orthopedic Network News. I know there's a lot of trends inside there, but to take the ones that are the winners, I know some of that's part of your secret sauce and how you operate, but I know you're willing to teach uh, and to share. So I think that could be interesting. Yeah, I'm terrible at keeping secrets when it comes to ways to improve. So, and by the way, if your health system doesn't want you to go to conferences, Beg to get to one of them. Get up to the one up in Pismo. It's beautiful. Every October, once we come out to the other side of this pandemic, get up to the California Hospital uh, Association of Healthcare Purchasing Materials Managers. It, it's beautiful there, and you're going to learn a lot. So yeah. that's my last pitch. That's a good point. You know, Brad is out there reading the research, going to um, AAOS, the conferences. Mm -hmm. Um, he is learning about the parts and materials, and I know it's not everybody can do that. You've got other work to do, but the more back to the more you know, the less you pay. Mm -hmm. uh, it really does add up. And so check out that Orthopedic Network news that we'll send you if you don't have a subscription now. You'll that'll be a new. Um, if you aren't already seeing it, there's some really good content. Feel free to reach out to me or Brad with any questions about what these mean. If you've got questions about that, or if you're wondering how do you compare to this trends, um, we, can, we can answer that for you as well. Thanks everybody. All right. Thanks yep. for Thanks throwing everyone. your gum away. Bye. Appreciate it. <laughs> awesome, thanks everyone, see ya.